Welcome to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Ron Duncan Hart, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Leonard B. Torben Memorial Lecture. And we are honored to be with author Isabel Kirshner this year, who will be interviewed by Bonnie Ellinger about her important new book on Israel as it fights for its soul. We want to thank all of you from the United States to Israel who support these programs that we have with leading authors and scholars who come from around the world. I'd like to say a word about Lynn Torben, after whom this annual lecture is named. He was a leading research scientist with an inquiring mind and broad intellectual interests. He loved Israel and Jewish philosophers such as Spinoza, and all of the programs in his memory have been dedicated to those subjects. We thank Marsha Torben for being a sustaining donor to the overall series and underwriting these lectures in his memory. I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Torben now, who is the founding director of the Santa Fe Jewish Film Festival, and she will introduce Isabel Kirshner and Bonnie Ellinger. Marsha. Thank you, Ron, and it's my pleasure to introduce Isabel Kirshner, who is a correspondent for the New York Times in Jerusalem, covering both Israeli and Palestinian politics and society. Previously, she was a senior editor at the Jerusalem Report. Fluent in Hebrew and with working Arabic, she has been reporting on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian divide since 1990, including Israel's wars with Gaza, the failed efforts at peacemaking, and the often fraught internal divisions and culture wars that shape the lives of Israelis and Palestinians today. Her latest book, The Land of Hope and Fear, Israel's Battle for Its Inner Soul, examines the schisms within Israeli society beyond just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and with a focus on domestic issues critical to understanding Israel today. The New York Times, which named the book a Times Notable Book of the Year, called it a masterful study. The Guardian referred to it as compelling, and the Jerusalem Post described it as a landmark book on Israel's societal schisms. Ms. Kirshner was born in Manchester, England, and graduated from Oxford University with a degree in Oriental Studies. She and her family have lived in Jerusalem since 1990. Ms. Kirshner will be in conversation with Bonnie Ellinger. Bonnie made Aliyah to Israel after high school, spending the early years on a kibbutz. She subsequently earned a PhD in applied linguistics and taught English at Bar Ilan University for many years. In Santa Fe, she has taught biblical and conversational Hebrew and has played a key role in the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series organization. Bonnie, I turn it over to you and welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Marsha, and thank you, Ron. Welcome, Isabel. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to speak to you about your extraordinary new book, The Land of Hope and Fear, Israel's Battle for Its Inner Soul, and to talk to you about the situation in Israel. Before we get to the book, which is an unflinching portrait of present day Israeli society, and which will be our main focus in the interview, would you like to share with us a few of your insights about the situation in Israel since October 7? So this is really a very, very critical moment. And, you know, of course it all began at 6.30 in the morning on October the 7th. Um, and, you know, I just want to take a step back and say, where where do we begin, you know, of, of how we got to that point? Um, you know, we could start a year ago, which is, uh, you know, just about when the November 2022 election was over. And actually when I finally had finished my last uh, touches on the book and it was going to press right then. Um, the government that was formed after that election, uh, which brought Netanyahu back to power, uh, was the most right wing and religiously conservative and ultra nationalist government Israel has ever had in its 75 years. Um, the agenda of the government, as you all know, was extremely polarizing. It set off on a, a campaign to overhaul the country's judiciary, 
in a way that many, many Israelis felt would undermine liberal democracy in Israel. We saw months and months of mass protests in the streets. We saw tens of thousands of reservists from the Israeli military saying, if this goes ahead, uh, we feel the government has broken its contract with the people. This is not what we signed up for, and we will not show up next time. Um, we saw a government where the main enemy appeared for the government to be the attorney general and the Supreme Court. Um, we heard warnings from the defense minister last March, uh, Yoav Gallant, from Netanyahu's own Likud party, saying that this situation could have absolutely devastating consequences for the security of Israel. It's making us look weak in, in the enemy's eyes. And Netanyahu, in reaction to that, tried to fire him. Um, so we can also start maybe from the morning of October the 7th or before 6.30 or, or from October the 6th, when this country was actually very, very wrapped up in reliving the trauma of the 1973 war. Um, it was literally the 50th anniversary of that terrible intelligence failure that led to the surprise. And the country had not healed over 50 years from that. The archives were opening up. We had the Golden movie, uh, reassessing Golden Met Year's legacy. Um, and, you know, what was what was on the agenda then on October the 6th, which was, you know, Sukkot, the end of Sukkot holiday, it was fights about uh, religious uh, practice in public space in Tel Aviv. Would, would people be uh, allowed to hold religious ceremonies with uh, gender separation in the middle of Tel Aviv? This is what was consuming Israel that, that day, night before. Um, or we can go even further back and say, you know, this is a country that's been split since before it was even founded, since before the state was founded in 1948 over where exactly Israel should be and how to handle the, the conflict with the Arab world and with the Palestinians and, you know, the issue of partition, um, a country that pushed off and pushed off dealing with that issue until it just became more and more and more complicated. The Palestinian leadership in the meantime has become so split and weakened and unable to deliver and, and increasingly radical um, with Hamas in Gaza. So all of these divisions have been there, um, all feeding in, in a way, to this moment. Now, I'm not saying that the divisions caused what happened. Hamas caused what happened on October the 7th. But it caught Israel at a very, very divided, um, tumultuous time in its history. And, you know, I, I called my book The Land of Hope and Fear. And the fear, well, you know, that's easy <laughs> to see now. Um, the fear of, of what happened on October the 7th, the people from those border communities along the Gaza border, they speak about it, of what happened that day as a Holocaust. Um, you had armed Hamas gunmen going from house to house, mm -hmm. literally murdering people in their beds. Um, and this is an absolute nightmare for, for the Israeli people. Um, these were communities which, for the larger part, believed in coexistence. Um, they, they believed that the people on the other side of the fence, the ordinary people, more or less probably wanted the same that they wanted out of life um, and had worked for coexistence in many cases, the kibbutzim along the border, and became the target of the most awful massacre. So the fear is easy to see. Um, then many people ask me, well, where's the hope? <laughs> so I'd just like to finish off 
these opening remarks by saying that what we've seen since October the 7th in terms of the citizens stepping up has actually been remarkable. Um, we saw during the mass protests of the year before, before for the preservation of Israel's liberal democracy, we saw gener the, the multi-generational masses of people coming out week and after week, holding the Israeli flag um, because they care. They cared about the future of the country. And what we saw on October the 7th and 8th was all those same people immediately pivot to volunteering, um, to just a huge public campaign for releasing the hostages and to focus the government's mind on releasing hostages. Um, because of course, as well as the 1200 people who were killed in Israel on October the 7th, uh, there were also 240 people that were taken hostage to Gaza. Um, we saw all those reservists who'd been saying that they wouldn't show up. Uh, boy, did they show up. Um, the army said they had 150% response to the call-up notices. Um, in the months before you heard the doctors talking about maybe wanting to leave Israel and relocate, well, on October the 7th, 8th, 9th, you had tens of thousands of Israeli youths who've been traveling abroad on the, the hummus trail in India, as they call it, or South America, fighting for places on planes to get back to Israel um, to defend the country as they saw it. And so I think just that response of the citizens has, has filled people here with uh, a renewed hope, a renewed strength of, of a feeling of identity uh, everybody now knows what it is to be an Israeli if they were questioning that before. Um, and I think we're seeing, you know, the beginnings of, of a big reckoning here. Um, the divisions haven't gone away and, and they won't just go away. We have a, a solidarity around the war effort now, but socially, of course, you know, nothing changes overnight. But you know, what we do have is uh, there's a very famous uh, saying of David Ben-Gurion, and it's etched on a, a big wall at the officers' uh, training academy at Bad Echad in the Negev Desert. And uh, David Ben-Gurion's quote is, may every Hebrew mother know that she has entrusted her child into the care of commanders who are worthy of the task. And what we're seeing now at these heartbreaking funerals for soldiers who have fallen in Gaza um, and generally in society, we're seeing eulogies and, and people saying now after this ultimate sacrifice, uh, may every Hebrew or Israeli citizen know that they have a leadership worthy of their people. Mm -hmm. um, there is very much a powerful feeling here of the people. And I think that was the hope that I felt on my journey working on this book. And I think we are seeing it in action today. So on that note, I'd be very happy to turn mm -hmm. over to you, Bonnie. And <laughs> Well, it, Isabel, Isabel, thank you so much for that very moving and beautiful opening to our discussion today. <clears throat> and you talked about the solidarity in Israel today, uh, which is which is really remarkable uh, to see people from all walks of life coming together, going to the fields in in uh, close to Gaza in the Gaza envelope, and picking. Uh, the fruit and helping out with things that have to be done because there's nobody else there. So from the solidarity, I'd like to take you back to the divisions, which is really what your book is about. So we're right. going to change course a bit. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'd like to talk about some of the uh, ideological, religious, 
political, social, and cultural divisions that you so beautifully uh, describe at length in your book. Each chapter is a, is a pearl. It's really remarkable. So since, um, since one of the topics that is uh, a very important one is the Haredim or the ultra-Orthodox, I'd like to talk about them mm. first. So David Ben-Gurion, the very secular first prime minister of Israel, established a so-called status quo agreement with the ultra-Orthodox non-Zionist Agudat Yisrael party so that it would not oppose the establishment of the state in 1948. What were the promise, promises made to the ultra-Orthodox? How did the powers and autonomy granted them sit with the secular Zionists? And what is the situation today? So the bottom line of the status quo agreement was that the Israeli state would have a Jewish character and respect certain principles. So the Sabbath, Shabbat, there wouldn't be public transportation. The Shabbat would be the weekend, the day of rest. Um, in public spaces, for example, you know, in the Knesset, the, the cafeteria would be kosher. Um, but very, very crucially, there were two other things. One was that the ultra-Orthodox would be allowed to run their own educational stream and educate their children as they saw fit, which largely meant um, focusing on Torah study and uh, ignoring secular studies, uh, core curriculum, math, science, English. Um, and, and the other thing that David Ben-Gurion agreed to was, was to allow an exemption of full-time Torah students from obligatory army military service. And that was largely to, you know, replace the Torah scholarship that was decimated during the Holocaust. And, you know, to, to give a sort of respect to that uh, spiritual side. And also because the, the yeshiva bachas weren't really going to make great soldiers, I guess. But crucially, at that time, he was talking about 400 students. Um, and now, of course, 75 years later, we have something like a quarter of all first graders in Israel who are now in the Haredi education system. Um, many, largely in the, in the male schools, in the boys' schools, not learning any core curriculum. Um, or very, very cursory, but hardly any math, English, science. Um, and, of course, with the, the exponential growth of that community demographically, because traditionally uh, the Haredi community favours large families, and you're talking about families with uh, seven, eight, nine, eleven children, the number of 18-year-olds who are from Haredi backgrounds, um, is now a, a large portion, I think something like 16% of the 18-year-old intake of, of any given year for the army. So what was a kind of symbolic uh, uh, spiritual gesture in 1948 has now turned into a, a huge issue where many, many Israelis who are traditional or secular, but not ultra-Orthodox um, and even national religious uh, feel that, you know, there's, there's not an equal sharing of the burden when it comes to military service. There are uh, awful predictions of what will happen to Israel in, in a few decades time if this large portion of the population continues to not be educated to work in a modern workforce um, and 
favours full-time tourist study in adult life over work. Um, that's not sustainable um, if, if the current trends demographically and, and in terms of the education continue. Um, and yes, how do the secular uh, forces react? Well, originally, I think David Ben-Gurion's concept was that, you know, in time, the Haredi community would kind of shrink and see the light, you know, <laughs> and be won over by modern uh, enlightenment and the modern uh, Israeli society. Um, and, you know, the, in a way, the, the opposite happened because the, the community just grew larger and larger and the hardcore became bigger and bigger. Um, so, you know, and have become quite a political force and have a lot of leverage in Israel's coalition governments and have sat in most of those uh, in, in recent decades. So, you know, it's it, the, on the other hand, I have to say that along with the growth of the core of the hardcore of the Haredi community, there's also a growing margin of, of Haredim who grow up in the community, but do want a more modern life um, they do see themselves as Israelis. They do want to go to work. Um, some join the army or volunteer. Um, you know, you have these uh, organizations here like Zaka, the search and rescue Opera and emergency services full of ultra orthodox volunteers who want to serve in another way. Um, and, and that's happening, too. So there's a kind of, uh, you know, dual dynamic going on here where in some ways Israel is becoming more Haredi in terms of the numbers but the Haredim are becoming more Israeli um, so you know how this is going to play out <laughs> um, we'll have to see but on the eve of October the 7th um, we were a few days away from the opening of the winter session of parliament of the Knesset and there was huge controversy, obviously, over the uh, what what was expected to be a resumption of the judicial overhaul. Um, but the primary um, issue on the agenda for the winter session, which the Haredi parties who hold a balance of power in this government uh, had insisted on, was to formalize an anchor in Israeli law the wholesale mass exemption from military service of the yeshiva community of, of most ultra-Orthodox uh, young men. And that was the agenda on October the 6th. Now, we're not hearing about that right now. <laughs> I think the Haredi parties understand that uh, to start raising that right now with the country at war, um, would not go down well by any stretch. But, uh, you know, does it mean that the society will change? I mean, we, we saw some initial movement in the ultra-Orthodox world after October the 7th, where people were talking about wanting to join the army, um, certainly feeling part of the general shock of society and wanting to volunteer and help. Um, will that translate in the longer term? We'll have to see. Uh, it's interesting that, <clears throat> that in the Knesset this past week, uh, for the budget, uh, it seems that massive amounts of money have passed the first reading to go to the Haredim instead of using some of that money to purchase ceramic vests for the soldiers. Is that correct? Well, as part of the coalition agreements reached exactly, you know, a year ago, um, huge funds were promised to the ultra-Orthodox education system. Um, there were arguments that the teachers were underpaid and that the schools were, were lacking. Um, now, in the past, Israel, the government had conditioned increased state funding of the ultra-Orthodox schools on the ultra-Orthodox schools agreeing 
to teach some core curriculum subjects, some secular studies, and said, if you want state funding, that's uh, dependent, conditional on, on you teaching your kids to be able to work in the future. Um, with this coalition agreement, that all went out of the window and huge amounts of coalition funds were promised. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing it being doled out. And yes, there, 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 are, uh, there are voices against that. Um, we heard Benny Gantz, who's a key member of the war cabinet now, who the centrist uh, politician who, who brought his party in after October the 7th to basically help with the war effort and, and in the name of national unity. Um, he raised his voice at a joint press conference with the prime minister last week and said, you know, it's not too late to change your mind about where these funds are going. Um, the government's argument is that there's enough money to go around and um, it, yes, but it, it's, it's, it's all part of the coalition politics here, the leverage that these medium and small sized parties have, um, any one of them can bring down a government. Um, and, you know, this is a sign really of Netanyahu's weakness um, against these these parties who uh, were made profligate, ridiculous promises in the coalition agreements and just his desperation to remain in power. Um, we, we're seeing that in action now. Yeah, we'll see what happens uh, after the war. <clears throat> um, in the chapter entitled Outpost Millenni Millennials, you describe the hilltop settlers as a sort of yuppie pioneering elite of the religious Zionist movement who are firm in their belief, <clears throat> excuse me, that the land in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, was their God-given birthright, especially after the Six-Day War. The rights of the Palestinians living on that same land are mostly ignored or worse. Was there ever a realistic possibility at arriving at a two-state solution? And what about now, post-October 7th? It's a big question. Um, I think there definitely was a realistic possibility <clears throat> before, you know, before the settlements grew and grew and spread out and spread out. Um, and it was very much a question of, of having the political will and the political ability on both sides of the line. And unfortunately, that just didn't happen at any point in time. Um, when it was reasonably not easy to do, but but easier than it is now. Um, there are people that will argue it is still possible to partition the West Bank. Um, a lot of these outposts, um, although they have a veneer of permanence about them, um, I describe in the book how the mobile homes have been clad in stone to give a kind of external impression of, of permanence, but actually they're still mobile homes. Um, if, if you really had the political will and ability on both sides of the mines, uh, the majority of the Jewish settler population still live within the settler blocks, um, which, you know, under previous blueprints, for a two-state solution could be swapped with alternative territory in, in border adjustments. Um, there, were, there was no territorial dispute with Gaza. Uh, Israel, when it unilaterally withdrew in 2005, it withdrew to the pre-1967 armistice lines to the inch. There's no territorial dispute there. Um, but Obviously, it just gets harder and harder with each passing year. The more settlements you have, the more um, entrenched they become, um, the weaker the Palestinian leadership. And yes, the more right wing Israel becomes. So, you know, there's, there's been a shift. And 
we're seeing in this government um, elements that in the past were considered fringe. Um, and now, you know, you have these fringe elements running the finance ministry and the national security ministry. Um, so, you know, can we turn the wheel back? But it, it, there's still no alternative in terms of a viable solution that anybody has come up with. And that's why we still hear the Biden administration talking about needing to keep the option of the two-state solution alive and not prejudice it by, by building more settlements. Um, because the more you have out there, you know, people say you, you can't unscramble an egg, you know, <laughs> and what, what we're getting territorially is, is a scrambled egg. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to go now to the Ashkenazi Mizrahi divide. And uh, for people listening, um, the Ashkenazi Jews are the ones who are mostly from Europe, United States. Uh, the Mizrahi Jews, uh, their background is from uh, the, uh, the Middle East, the uh, Arab countries. And this has always been a problem. And you write, that um, the Ashkenazi Mizrahi divide, which has persisted since the founding of the state, should have become anachronistic after seven decades. How is it that all these years later, this legacy of discrimination still exists in many facets of Israeli life? And one more question. How did Ashkenazi politicians like Begin and Netanyahu make use of the underdog status of the Mizrahis to their political advantage? And how did Ben-Gurion not understand in 1948 what Begin and Netanyahu understood 30 years later and beyond? It's a big question. It is. Let me start from the end. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, when, when the Mizrahi waves of immigration began in the 1950s, this was a blessed thing for Ben Gurion and for, for the Ashkenazi establishment at the time. Um, Israel wanted and needed population. And, you know, Israel very much was was happy to have these waves of Jews coming from Morocco, from Iraq, from Egypt. Um, but the Israeli needs at the time were also to populate some of the sparser, remoter areas of the country. And so many of the immigrants from Morocco, from Iraq, they, they were taken basically from the boats or from the airports uh, to remote locations where Israel needed to populate. Um, and they were kind of dumped in these transit camps, which were, you know, sheds and, and, and tents at the beginning, um, freezing cold in the winter, muddy and, and boiling hot in the summer, very little employment anywhere near in the vicinity. Um, and, you know, this this kind of, in a way, um, drew the line right then um, between the urban, more established Ashkenazim who were around the Tel Aviv area and, you know, with commercial opportunities and many of the Mizrahim who were in these, you know, very remote areas. Some were given, you know, communities with chicken farms or whatever, but uh, opportunities were slim. And the attitude toward the Mizrahim was very arrogant at the time from the Ashkenazi political establishment. Um, Arabic, many came speaking Arabic. That was the language of the enemy. There was uh, not only no respect for the culture that uh, the, the Jews coming from the Muslim world were bringing with them, it was actually looked down upon and became a kind of taboo 
Um, and you know, this this was the beginnings of of the the split of the of the divide, the Ashkenazi Mizrahi divide. Um, as we go forward, you know, to how did Begin manage to capitalize on this? Um, Menachem Begin, you know, he he was the kind of flip side of of Ben Gurion's labor Zionism, and he was the Jabotinskyite revisionist right wing um, part of of the building of the state. But after the seventy three war, um, when resentment began to grow against, you know, partly because of that failure, largely because of, of that failure of, of, of the surprise of 73. Um, you had this huge resentment growing against the old Ashkenazi labor establishment that had been in charge of the country since 1948. And Begin just knew how to capitalize on that. And he he rode into power in 1977 in the political revolution of that year, which for the first time brought the Likud and the right into power in Israel. Um, and he rode in on that wave of resentment, much of which was was fired by the Mizrahi underdogs of society. Now, when we fast forward to today, um, we have a, a, a very complex picture because Culturally, you know, the Mizrahi Jews make up about half the Jewish population of Israel. Culturally, there's been a complete turnaround. Mizrahi culture now is, is in. Um, singers here, Jewish Mizrahi singers sing in Arabic. Um, Moroccan food is, is, you know, the the mainstay for many Israelis. Um, the, the highest paid pop singers here, they're all Mizrahi singers. Um, it's become mainstream Israeli culture. And you have a young generation who've become much more educated than their parents were. And you have a lot of mixed families of the Ashkenazi and Mizrahi parents and, and the children are completely mixed. And, you know, it's very hard nowadays really to tell honestly, who's a Mizrahi and who's a Ashkenazi, quite frankly, in many, many cases. And yet, you know, as you asked, Bonnie, why is there still the notion of divide? And that is partly because for Netanyahu, um, it, 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 it's, it works. You know, a lot of the Likud base has remained loyal ever since the days of Begin. The hatred of the old labor establishment has gone from generation to generation of how people's grandparents were treated when they came the narrative of the building of the country of you know what was seen as the ashkenazim taking all the credit for building the country um whereas the mizrahim really they had a hard time they populated these remote areas the tent cities, the, the, the transit camps turned into development towns, which were often very miserable places to be. Um, but, but they played their part in building this country and populating this country and felt it was never appreciated or recognized. So now with the younger generation, you have young activists who are taking on these issues and wanting to right the old wrongs and to not sweep it under the carpet of history and say, well, we're doing okay now, but to mm -hmm. actually look back and, and redress some of these issues. And it's everything from land allocation, you know, where you have uh, kibbutzim with, with large tracts of land now selling off land to and making a lot of profit for building um projects right next to some of these development towns you know in these rural areas or along the borders which became crowded and don't have room to expand and didn't have the same access to to resources so you have a young generation of Mizrahi activists who are actually actively trying to to redress some of these old wrongs to get their parents and grandparents role recognized in the building of the country and the Zionist enterprise. 
Um, and, and you have politicians like Netanyahu who continue to feed on, on those resentments for political gain. Um, and because much of his base did remain um, in the development towns, the, the Mizrahim have remained very loyal to the Likud and to whoever the leader of the Likud is. Um, you know, it's just been of political benefit for, for him and for many in his party to continue firing up those resentments every time we come to an election. It, it has a name here, the, the ethnic genie. You know, <laughs> and every time it's like the ethnic uh, demon comes out again and somebody uses it in an election um, to fire up the base. And that's why it's still there. It's working. It seems to be working. Yes. <clears throat> Isabel, I'd like us to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the basic law nation state. Hmm. Israel is the Jewish state but there are other ethnic groups living there. Arabs, Druze, Bedouin. Arab citizens make up about 20% of the country's population, while there are approximately 2 million Palestinians in the West Bank, also known as Judea and Samaria, who do not have citizenship. Can you describe, please, the controversial 2018 basic law that states that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Absolutely. So this is something that some elements, mainly on the right and in the Likud, were pushing for for many years. And they, they felt that although the Declaration of Independence called Israel a Jewish state. There was nothing in the basic laws of the country that anchored that legis in, in legislation. Um, and they wanted it because when you come to the Supreme Court, for example, um, with a petition, the Jewishness of the state wasn't in the law anywhere. And, and therefore the judges had no basis to rule on you know <laughs> the Jewish state aspect of, of various uh, issues brought before the court. So in 2018, finally, um, this law was legislated. Why was it so controversial? Because it does anchor in law that Israel's a Jewish state, that the Sabbath is the day of rest, that the Hebrew calendar and the festivals are marked nationally, all sounds very benign. What it didn't say was that Israel is also a democratic state and that uh, it also uh, is, rests on principles of equality. That was nowhere in the law. So it came out like a sort of law of, you know, that this is uh, national self-determination is, is unique to the Jewish people in the land. It didn't specify which, where, which part, how, how much of the land. Um, it kind of downgraded Arabic from, you know, as, as a kind of quasi status it had as an official language and just said it, and it now had some special status that was undefined. Um, and the fact is, there is no other law in Israel on the books that does talk explicitly about equality. And therefore, um, the other many Jews felt that this was a racist law. Many Jews felt uncomfortable with this law um, and not to speak of the, the minorities here, including the Druze population who are conscripted into military service. Um, and other parts of, of the population who are not Jewish. Uh, we have 400,000 um, immigrants from the former Soviet Union and their descendants who are not halachically Jewish. They are not considered fully Jewish under the strict interpretations of, of Jewish law, um, but are Israeli and came here with with full entitlement under the law of return because of their Jewish ancestry or because they were married to Jews. 
or of the children of Jews or even the grandchildren of Jews. Um, and so, you know, this this became a real red flag for a lot of people. And when this war uh, broke out on October the 7th um, and we started to see, you know, six, seven Druze soldiers fallen in the first days of the war, including some very uh, respected and admired Druze commanders, it came back on the agenda of, of you know, how, how can it be? this law still stands when you have people who are not Jewish dying in the service of the country. Um, so again, the government made some kind of promise that they would legislate a separate law for the Druze community. Um, other people just want to see that that nation state law either go or be amended and to be more in line with Israel's declaration of independence from 1948 that did talk about equality. Um, so it, it's an ongoing controversy, um, which is still on the books. Supported, um, I, I would imagine, uh, not by Netanyahu's government, by the coalition and the very extreme right wing people in the coalition. Right, the most, the most they're willing to entertain at this point is a separate law that would acknowledge the Druze special status. But when it comes to, as you rightly pointed out, the one fifth of the population of Israel proper who are citizens of the state, who are Arab citizens of the state, um, you know, that that doesn't satisfy them. The Druze are a tiny minority within that minority. They're no more than one and a half or two percent of Israel's population. We all know that Israel is a country of immigrants. It always has been. And each wave has been distinctive. You dedicate a chapter each to the Russians and the Ethiopians. How would you describe the challenges that each of these different groups have faced? How well have they been integrated into Israeli society? Well, yeah, the Russian, I called it the Russians because that's how the, the former Soviet Union waves of immigration are known here. Any Russian speaking uh, Israelis, whether they come from Ukraine or, or uh, wherever else, uh, the Russians. Um, now, the big wave came with the collapse of, of the Soviet Union uh, and the crumbling of, of the of the Iron Wall and, and the Iron Curtain. And it was difficult at first. Um, you saw many engineers and violinists and top class uh, physicists coming over and ending up cleaning houses or working in sanitation or other low grade jobs. Um, that that was a, it was a difficult immigrant experience in those first years. But the people that, who came from the Soviet Union came with a very, very Soviet work ethic um, and a, a desire to strive for excellence and invested a lot in, in their children and their education. Um, and what we've seen is a, a remarkable integration, actually, of the Russian speaking immigration. Um, and, you know, the country is culturally has flourished and benefited from orchestras and, and uh, a lot of culture. Um, the high tech industry that was just in its infancy then in, in the 1990s benefited also from the influx of, of engineers. Um, and we did see actually a very successful integration there. Um, there is one major outstanding problem though, and that I already touched upon, which is many of the immigrants who came under the law of return, fully entitled to immigrate to Israel because of their connections, their Jewish family connections, but are not themselves considered Jewish according to Orthodox Jewish law. And of course, in Israel, 
um, life cycle events, marriage, uh, divorce, you know, there, there's a monopoly here by the orthodox, the strictly orthodox authorities, the rabbinate. And so many immigrants and their children and their grandchildren can't officially get married here. There's no civil marriage. Um, and, you know, they, they're, they're almost at the crux of, of this debate here and culture war between religion and state. You know, there is no separation here between religion and state. And uh, many of the Russian speaking immigrants and fam their families are bearing the brunt of that. So many just find their way around it very creatively. There's a huge industry here of alternative weddings. Um, nobody, you know, many, many people are just bypassing the rabbinate and doing their own thing. And it's kind of chaos. Um, Trips to Cyprus. <laughs> yeah, the, people used to go to Cyprus and have a secular uh, municipal wedding and come back with a wedding certificate that would then be recognized here. Quite honestly, I think most people aren't even bothering doing that anymore. People are just having a wedding where they get married by their older brothers or friends, and have a party and live happily ever after. And, uh, you know, as common law spouses, you are entitled to practically the same rights. Um, you can sign a civil union agreement with a lawyer uh, over property and and other financial affairs. And that that's what many people are doing. And it's not only the Russians doing that now, it's many, many Israelis who just don't want to deal with the chief rabbinate. So they started a trend. The Ethiopians, um, Ethiopian Israelis, you know, they, they've had an even harder time. They're a small minority. Many came without, um, you know, from very rural areas of Gondar province or wherever and had to really make their way in a modern society that was totally strange and, and foreign. And of course, you know, being black Jews, you can't change the color of your skin. It's very hard to blend in and integrate and, you know, just get the right accent and then no one will know where you came from, <laughs> you know. Um, many of the First generation who came here never really learned Hebrew and had to, you know, their children would mediate for them with the authorities. Um, there has been racism. There have been commissions. That, you know, it's not institutional racism. The government has instituted many commissions to try deal with it. And, uh, you know, but, but there has been informal, you know, societal discrimination. Um, but again, you're seeing a younger generation who have become increasingly educated and determined, and they've been out on the streets protesting against racism, and their voice has been heard. Um, they are not shy. Um, there, there are many Ethiopian, very talented Ethiopian Israelis who have been active and who've gone into politics and into the arts and into every other level of Israeli society. And, you know, I think we're also beginning to see the fruits of that now. Oh, good. I have one last question, Ron, okay, before we go to Q&A. Ron, is that okay? Okay. Um, you have a wonderful chapter called High Tech in the Sand. <laughs> near the end of the book. You talk about the relationship with the Emiratis, how new business horizons in the Middle East generated by the Abraham Accords have opened up for Israel. So what will happen now after October 7th? Will these mutually beneficial relationships continue? It's a good question, Bonnie. Um, from what we're seeing so far, um, look, the, the Emiratis and the Gulf Arabs and their relationship with Israel, it's, it's very transactional. Um, there are big interests on both sides. And when the Emiratis do business, they keep politics out of it. Um, you just see 
in the Emirates, if you go to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, you know, there, there are 200 different national, national, nationalities working there. Um, nobody speaks politics. It's taboo. Business is business. Um, so we're not hearing about any major downturn. Um, I think, you know, the relationship is is on an evil keel, even keel. I think the interests that were there before remain now. Um, and that is not only business, but also uh, an, an a, alliance of, of moderate states and Israel against the Iranian axis, axis in the region. Um, the interests there have not changed. Um, of course, on the eve of October the 7th, everybody was talking about the next big prize, which was supposed to be a movement towards a similar kind of normalization with Saudi Arabia, which would have been the big coup and the big prize for Netanyahu and the government. And uh, very, very key, actually, for Israel and, and its status in the region. Um, because Saudi Arabia is is the big power, you know. If if Egypt made peace with with Israel um, forty years ago, this this was the next big game changer in the region. Now, some people will say that that was a main driver for Hamas wanting to disrupt that, um, and it probably has been disrupted for now. But again, in the longer term, at the end of the day, nobody's fundamental interests have changed here. Um, so, you know, we might see in the future that effort get back on track. Um, I, I don't think that like the deals with the Emirates and Bahrain, that it will be possible for the Arab states normalizing with Israel to just ignore the Palestinian issue in the future. Um, I think, you know, the Palestinian issue is back on the agenda. Um, and if people thought that there could be a deal between Israel and Saudi with just some very symbolic nominal nod toward the Palestinians, that will probably have to go through some rethinking now. But at the end of the day, um, the general trend of Israel becoming more integrated into the Middle East and, and finding more of these relationships eventually will probably carry on because at the end of the day, as I say, the interests haven't changed. Uh, Isabel, before I hand things over to Ron for the q and I just want to thank you for an absolutely wonderful discussion. And I think uh, all of us know so much more now about the situation in Israel. And of course, your wonderful book and everything that you have covered in the book. So I just want to personally thank you. And now you. I'll give it back to Ron. Thank you. We have a number of questions uh, from the audience. And um, so if it's good for you, Isabel, to take a few more minutes, we'll we'll look at these. Um, David Goldfarb comments, asks, what are the chances of the 2018 nation state law being revoked in the near future? Okay, you, you addressed part of that already. Um, not only, and he goes on to say, not only is it, he considers it to be immoral, but also foolish, both as part of trying to include uh, Arab Israelis in Israel as a whole, from a Hashbara perspective, uh, the world sees Israel and Israel uh, sees Israel claiming to be a true democracy for all its inhabitants. Now, um, I don't know. Can you address that? Yeah. Look, will it be revoked? Not by this government. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think, as I said in my opening remarks, I think there is going to be a, a big reckoning at the end of all of this. We we don't know how this war is going to end or when it's going to end. But at some point, you know, we're already seeing a, a big divide um, resurfacing uh, or beginning to emerge, even if it's still mainly below the surface. And that is, on the one hand, you have uh, the 
supporters of this government and the Netanyahu supporters, the, the BB steam as they call them, who will be blaming um, the protesters and the reservists who said they wouldn't show up. Um, and, you know, all the Israelis who came out onto the streets against the government over the last year, they'll be blaming them for, for making Israel look weak in the eyes of, of the enemy. And, and on the other side, you'll have the liberal Israelis um, blaming a government that mm -hmm. failed, that did not see this coming, that was absolutely obsessed with all the wrong things. Um, and I think we are going to see some political realignment where we're going to see elections at some point, uh, way before they were due. Um, and we, you know, are probably going to see a political change. I don't like to predict if Netanyahu will survive or won't survive. Um, it's always a bad idea to write him off because he keeps coming back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and it does depend how this war ends. Does it end with Hamas diminished or gone and all the hostages back, which would be a great victory for Israel? Or does it end with something vaguer? We don't know. Um, but there will be a political reckoning and there will be a realignment. And depending on, on the outcome of that, you know, the, the nation state law could well be back on the agenda um and and yes there, there's there's a lot a lack of of wisdom in in that law having been passed the way it was um at the time people said well it's just symbolic well if it's just symbolic why do it you know <laughs> if it's going to be so uh controversial and so provocative uh why do it um so yes i mean we could see change there will this government revoke it no. Erica Jones and uh, Judy Klinger both have a, a, a question about uh, Netanyahu's support for Hamas and uh, particularly referring to the article that came out in the New York Times today uh, mm -hmm. by Ronan Bergman and um, Mark uh, Mazzetti. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could comment on that. Yeah, I wouldn't say that it was his support for Hamas. I don't think any Israeli that you will find was was actively supporting Hamas. But there was definitely a, a, a notion for a long time of, of a kind of divide and rule um, that if, if Hamas was functioning in Gaza and you had a, an address in Gaza that you could deal with, um, and, and if that was Hamas, then it would split the Palestinian polity and make it, you know, to lessen pressure on Israel to come to terms with the Palestinian Authority. Um, there are people in this government who see the Palestinian Authority, the Western-backed authority in the West Bank as, you know, a terrible enemy that, that had to be diminished. Um, um, but I think what we saw was a kind of what the Israeli government and what Netanyahu thought over the years was a kind of pragmatic policy of, of buying quiet, um, get Hamas into a position of being responsible and, and governing their own people in Gaza and thinking less about fighting Israel and more about providing jobs for the Palestinians um, and Hamas kind of fed into this with a, a deception over the last year and a half where it, it made Israel believe or, or fed into the Israeli government's belief that what really mattered for Hamas at this time was to get more work permits for Gazans to come and work in Israel, to keep those suitcases of Qatari money coming into Gaza um, and, and, you know, Israelis and Netanyahu and the government saw it really as, as buying quiet. Um, of course, it all totally blew up in their faces. It was a deception. That's not what Hamas is about or was about. Um, all the while, they'd been planning October the 7th. 
And coming back to the basic law question again, um, Halle Faust has a question about, um, he said that during the debates, there were lawyers and politicians who claimed the equality of citizens uh, was already dealt with in other legislation uh, and wasn't really needed. And But that you claim today this is not the case. Would you kindly elaborate on the distinction? Yeah, look, the word equality doesn't appear in any of the other basic laws, but there, there were two major basic laws legislated in the 1990s that the Supreme Court of Israel interpreted as meaning that uh, there should be equality for citizens. It was about human dignity and the right to, to work. Um, and, and the Israeli Supreme Court judges interpreted that as, as meaning that there should be equality. And they have used that standard in their uh, rulings ever since. And that, that was what uh, was considered the, the legal revolution of the 1990s that this particular government was fighting against when it was so bent on pushing through this judicial overhaul. The idea was to roll all of that back. Um, I, I would say that there are many people in this current government and on the Israeli right who don't believe in equality. The ultra-Orthodox parties don't want equality or believe in equality. The far right don't believe in equality for, for the Arab citizens of Israel, the Palestinian Arab citizens. Um, what you hear from, from Netanyahu himself, if you listen carefully over the last year, was that Israel would respect the equal rights of individuals, of individual citizens, but not equal rights for groups. Um, Israel, this government, the right in Israel doesn't believe in equal rights for the Arab citizens as a group, as, as a minority, only equality on an individual level. Um, and, and you won't find the word equality written in any of the laws. As I say, it was the way the Supreme Court interpreted those basic laws but it didn't appear in them. And therefore, when the nation state law was passed, um, the fact that that was omitted there as well, and any mention of democracy, um, when you're talking about the nation state and trying to define what it is, that that was seen as, as uh, by many, many people as a egregious omission that was not accidental. Avril Harris, um, who is an ex-South African, uh, asked you to speak to the, the accusation of the apartheid, um, and he pointing out that there are Arabs in the Knesset and Arab heads of departments in hospitals and in, in, in ministries and that sort of thing. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah, look, I this is this is touchy, touchy ground, but I I've never really found the campaign to label Israel as an apartheid state, either correct or useful in any way. Um, if you take just the West Bank, okay, and you say, well, there are two different laws there for the Jewish settlers and the Palestinian population. There's a two tier system where Jewish settlers are considered Israeli citizens and are tried in Israeli courts if they're tried, whereas the Palestinians are tried in military courts. You know, some people will say, well, there's a clear example of apartheid. But, you know, the fact is that, that a lot of the arrangements that are in place now in the West Bank, in the occupied West Bank, are the result of agreements under the Oslo Accords of the 1990s. Now, of course, the Oslo Accords were supposed to have resulted by now in, in a permanent agreement and in Palestinian, some form of, of uh, Palestinian self-determination, and that hasn't happened. Um, but to label it apartheid, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I, I agree with that even in the West Bank. But when it comes to Israel proper, 
to call it Israel proper and apartheid state. Um, it, it's just wrong. I mean, the, 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 yes, there are problems. There's been discrimination. There are uh, gaps in, in legal terms. Um, but but Arab Israelis are in the Knesset. We had an Arab Israeli party in the government, in the last government. Um, it, it's not apartheid. And, it, you know, in some ways it kind of cheapens the concept of, of what apartheid was in South Africa. And I know there are legal definitions of apartheid that uh, people apply and say it doesn't mean it's like South Africa. Um, but but that term does mean something. And I think if you live in Israel for, for anything more than two days, you will see that, that this is not an apartheid society in Israel proper. Uh, David, <laughs> David Shulman um, asks an interesting historical question. Um, how would Menachem Begin look at Israel's current government? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think he would like it much. <laughs> uh, Menachem Begin, you know, he, he was a stickler for the rule of law. And I don't think he would be very happy with all this, uh, <laughs> you know, judicial overhaul business where... Um, this government has been trying to curb the authorities of the Supreme Court and to, uh, you know, um, basically to, to, to limit its powers in, in a country which lacks any formal constitution. It has one house of parliament. Um, it has a figurehead president whose role is mostly symbolic. And, and already today, um, the power lies with whoever can muster a 61 seat majority in the 120 seat parliament. And the only block on that power of the government is the Supreme Court at this point. So to have the government with its, in this case, 64 majority, trying to limit and curb the authorities of the Supreme Court, I, I don't think Menachem Begin would have been happy at all. We have a couple of questions about the, the settler community. <clears throat> One of them is um, especially referring to what are the divisions in that community that have emerged since the eruption of the war? And any other comment that you can make about it? You don't really hear so much uh, about divisions within the settler community, but I think that there are divisions. And the settler community itself, I mean, you're talking of hundreds of thousands of people. You're talking, you know, within the West Bank of 400,000 plus people now of, of Jewish settlers, but they're not homogenous. You have urban settlements where many, it's very mixed. You have secular Jews, you have Orthodox Jews, you have some massive ultra-Orthodox settlements which are very close to the 67 lines. Um, and then you have the ideological religious Zionist settlements, which tend to be more homogenous within themselves and, and spread more around the, the territories and closer to the Palestinian population centers. And, and their ideology is to prevent any Palestinian contiguous state from arising there. Um, in the last election, you know, because the more moderate Jewish home party that had represented part of the settler community was seen as having betrayed the settlers by going into a government for the previous year with Yair Lapid, the centrists and, and, and Benny Gantz and heaven forbid, an Arab party of uh, Mansour Abbas, the, the Islamic Ram party. Um, he, he'd burnt his bridges, Bennett, with the settler community. And in the last election, there was no Jewish home. There was no more moderate Jewish settler party to vote for. 
So many of the settlers who couldn't bring themselves to vote for a non-religious party all voted for Smotrich and, and religious Zionism, which is the hardline ultra-nationalist end of the settler movement. I don't know if they would all do so again. Um, as I say, you don't really hear much vocal split out there right now, um, but, but I'm not sure after what we've seen over the last year that, that many of those people would, would vote the same way again. Um, we'll have to see by the next election who is running, what new parties are forming, what new alliances are forming. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's certainly not a given that, that we'll see a repeat of, of, of the most extreme elements of the settler movement basically have, having leverage over a government of Israel. Isabel Kirshner, thank you so much for going through this and giving us all of this insight. The, there are a number of other questions that we really can't uh, address at this point, um, but we will, um, we, we thank you for all of this. Bonnie, thank you for the, the leading this discussion, the wonderful questions. Marsha, for the support for these programs and that the, the wonderful introductions that you made as we start today. Before we leave, I would like to just highlight this. Um, this is a wonderful book, and I really would like to encourage, if you haven't read it, um, this is a book that helps to understand where Israel is today. And looking at, at the background, uh, you know, there, there are some wonderful, very personal accounts. The writing is beautiful. The, the discussions are uh, good. And, Go get the book. Just <laughs> <laughs> get it you. on your own and read it and share it with friends. It's worth it, yes. So. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's been lovely being with you all. Thank you all. And uh, Bonnie, thank you for the questions. And, and you. all of you for listening. And thank you, Marcia and Ron. It's been really a pleasure being with you all. And happy Chanukah. Happy Chanukah. Chag Sameach. Thank you for being here. Remember, you can see more of these programs on the Jewish Learning Channel on YouTube, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.